Here we go. Welcome, everyone, to Architectural Acoustics. Please switch your uh, musical entertainment off. Finish your jokes. If someone is talking next to you, you can smack them in the face, please. <laughs> Hello. Oh, sorry, sorry. That's all right. Cool. So welcome uh, to Architectural Acoustics, your most challenging thing this year. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, it, it, it is very challenging to study. It is not so challenging to just get on with it and pass the module. So you don't have to worry. But it will definitely give you the opportunity to dig deep into stuff. Okay, that's, that's our purpose here. Uh, there's some uncertainty still about how everything is going to pan out. But I'll come to that in a second. Uh, I'm Zach. That's my legal name if you, wanna, if you need that. Uh, I know some of you, I guess but not all of you. In any case, uh, I will get to know you. I'm horrible with names, but we will have practicals, as you probably know from looking at the timetable. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. But first, what are we looking at? A bit of a standard thing here, aims and objectives. Uh, well, essentially, acoustics is, I mean, I really don't want to read stuff out for you. I guess you're doing that while I'm talking anyway. Uh, th the real interesting thing about acoustics is that it is magic and the, the nice thing is that it's not just me saying it who finds many things magical otherwise but it's, it's the people who have spent decades starting with physics starting with mathematics spending a whole lot of time with acoustics and they come out at the other end 30 40 years later and they say actually you never know okay so it has the complexity which surpasses basic causative modeling Okay, so what do I mean when I say causative modeling? We tend to believe that everything has a cause and effect. And in fact, we have a great amount of experimental data that shows that to be the case. However, the experimental data comes from laboratories, from controlled environments, where we typically reduce variables. Okay, that's how a scientific experiment runs. You reduce variables as much as possible. Now, already in basic biology, among others, meteor meteorology and other scientific fields, we stumble across the fact that causative models for prediction fail. Okay, so what we talk about then is complex systems. And complex system is a huge topic in science, which I invite you to study. It's extremely interesting thing, which goes into how things are actually unpredictable. Okay, so it is only the lay people who still have it in the back of their mind that everything is a cause and effect. We can predict everything if we had sufficient data, but scientists are beyond that and it's been a few decades already. Okay, and acoustics is one of those domains where this is quite apparent. Okay, so you can design things based on the best models, you can run the best simulations out there, and you might be surprised by the result. Okay, so it is extremely complex. One of the reasons it's so complex is the huge, uh, what is it, uh, what is it called, uh, monolith, which stands between sound and perception, which is psychoacoustics. Okay, so I'm actually not too sure about, did you study any psychoacoustics? No. So I'm actually probably going to squeeze in a lecture of that just to scratch the surface. Although I do have these lectures on a YouTube channel already. So I might just refer you to that instead and keep it. I think it we did a bit of that. Huh? I think we did a bit of that. Did you last year, yeah? I showed you some bits. Not really. It was just uh, maybe it was, a Maybe it was different for our year. It was two years ago. Oh, two years yeah, ago. Exactly. But it was like even less than a lecture. It was just like referred to really yeah. briefly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have two one-hour lectures on YouTube, so I will refer you to that if you're interested, because actually, also as far as the acoustics go, we are merely scratching the surface. Okay, you have to understand this is an engineering subject, you know, with the amount of math and physics we have as a background, as a, you know, we're just not going to get there, not even close. Okay, so we're going to get to the practical stuff, the usable stuff for us. Uh, but just briefly about the psychoacoustics, because one of the really interesting things is, for example, as I walk in this room, 
uh, well, obviously now I'm kind of paying attention to it, but if I'm just walking in this room and talking nonsense like we normally do, then I don't notice the change of the acoustic. I don't notice the change of how my voice sounds, but it does. You can do this as a matter of experiment. In fact, you probably have to ask someone to do it because you will know the punchline if I tell you. Uh, if you take a voice recorder, talk while you walk, and find another rhyme as well, and walk into another room and keep doing it, right? then you have that recording. Then you can ask the subject, did you hear the change of the room acoustic? And they will likely report no. If you listen to the recording, if you make them listen to the recording, they will realize the difference is huge. Okay? And the other thing, which is even more pertinent, you can do this as a matter of experiment. If you have two different pairs of uh, studio monitors, or in the house, two people, you know, they have, potentially. Do you live together, all music techs, by now? I hope so. No? Bit, bit, bits and bobs? Maybe we should... I mean, I would be up for, you know, making a music tech hotel like that. <laughs> with a venue and a studio and all the rest, obviously. And cubicles for sleeping. Um, let's do that. Someone want to do a finally a project, create a proposal, and then we will find the funding and do it properly? Yeah. I'm up for it. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do that. I mean, I mean, because I normally say this, I'll try to catch the thread I'm, that I'm leaving now, uh, but I don't know if you've noticed, but, you know, actually I should ask it as a question, what, what, what's, what's this place worth for you? You know, what's, what's the good thing about being here? Academy? Yeah, in general or maybe more specific to music tech. What's Connection the social part? It is the social part, yeah. I typically say something like, well, listen, you know, 50 years ago, you actually had to go to a huge university that has a unique library, and you would have spent, you know, a few thousand hours in that library. That was the only way to do it. That's not the case anymore, obviously. The second thing that you really needed from a great university is some amazingly clever people saying stuff which you potentially do or not have, I'll leave that to you. But in any case, YouTube is already filled with very clever people covering these topics. So even that is kind of falling off. I mean, you get the kind of assessment, I can tell you how well you've done, if that's your cup of tea, not mine in any case. Uh, so I'm not so interested in judging uh, performance, although it's part of the thing. And obviously you get the diploma, right? But actually the real important thing, the thing that it's really worthwhile is connecting with all the guys from the same age group with the same interest. And, you know, 10 years later, if you know these people, you know, oh, the, he's, he, he's in the studio in Derby, this guy's doing venue, this guy's doing gear hire, oh, I need some gear, you call them up. This kind of network is the most amazing thing. And then even more so, I'm typically, you know, hammering quite a bit on producing music together. I have, I have the idea of uh, doing it a bit like a bicycle uh, uh, team. You know how the bicycle teams look, work? Yeah. You have a runner, right? So you have a marathon to run. So you have a runner. In, in our music tech, it would be the guy who can hold the mouse for three hours without complaining. You know, we, so see, he, see, he sits at, or she sits at the front, does the thing. Everyone in the back does their thing, gets wasted, you know, stupid comments, makes jokes. So we have a runner who really pulls the whole group, and once the thing is boiling and bubbling, then the guys in the back should start fighting who gets to touch the mouse and actually do the editing and the you know, sample selecting and all the rest. Because you know, in this domain of creating electronic music, we're kind of you know, alone in a room, and it's, it doesn't really... I mean, even if you manage to create a very positive social vibe in that environment, it's not true. You know, it's your imagination of how things could work if we were having a party, but you're not necessarily having a party. I mean, unless you're consuming heavily, which I tell, please don't, right? So you don't want to make an artificial party, you want a real party. And we can do this by producing together. Okay, so where did I leave it off? <laughs> this was my tangent. Left somewhere around psychoacoustics. Oh yeah, psychoacoustics, thank you. So the big, the big monolith of psychoacoustics stands in between. So the experiment, the second one that you can do if you have multiple pairs of speakers at home, is take them to one room, 
mostly we do blind tests with all of this stuff and uh, listen to both pairs see if you recognize the pair of speakers right also record this session with a recorder now do the same thing in another room and what I expect that you will find is that you can always recognize different speakers in different rooms but if you hear the recording of that you are unlikely to recognize different speakers in different rooms so not only we have a very strong compensation uh, or exclusion so to speak of the room acoustic from our perception right because you don't want to you want to listen to what I have to say you don't want to keep listening to oh my god this space sounds beautiful we also have a recognition of sources that works with the room and with the whole context okay so your source recognition is also something that works quite a bit every moment of your life okay so in any case and that's true for a visual uh, stimuli as well you don't see pixels right if you enter this room if you see me for the first time you won't see the pixels of my face the first thing you will perceive is what i'm not looking for a compliment here but I could take one or two. The first thing you perceive is threat or no threat. Okay, so if I have a totally warped face and huge claws and I, you know, an even worse accent and all the rest, uh, maybe green face or something, then that's the first thing you will perceive. So once you get beyond the threat or no threat, then you get into recognition. Then you get into shapes. And then if you're asked to, you might as well pay attention to the pixels. Okay, and same thing with music, same thing with sound. First thing you perceive is whether it's threatening you or not. And obviously when you go to a club, you want it to be threatening, right? <laughs> then you're pleasantly surprised by, by the amount of uncomfortable bass, I hope. Okay, so th that's the thing. We don't see pixels, we don't hear the actual sound. And in psychoacoustics, I just came, I teach psychoacoustics in Hungary, and I came up with the best psychoacoustics joke, obviously, a bit pretentious on my part. But uh, the, it goes like this. So, uh, do you hear wind? Oh no, let's say, do you hear my voice? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's a joke, right? So, uh, the, 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 uh, the correct answer is, uh, 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 you are aware of me declaring that I hear your voice. And that's a horrible psychoacoustic joke because in, in psychoacoustics what you get is the necessity to account for declaration. So if someone says, I hear it, you cannot write in the paper, he or she hears that. You can write, they declare to have heard that. Okay, so there is quite a lot of layers uh, which make it actually impossible to make very... Uh, strong cases in this domain often and it allows us to make funny jokes uh, n not funny jokes <laughs> I meant okay um, let's get on with stuff obviously I will you will learn uh, how I typically do this I like to uh, I like to talk a lot of nonsense and anecdotes and and not necessarily follow the the things I hope you will enjoy it but let's just make sure we're covering what are we doing here uh, understanding and researchability. So the research itself, well, what's the most important thing? The most important thing is to distinguish marketing from science. How do you do that? Check Any ideas? Hmm? Check the funding, the funding. Check the defining if you can. Check what they say. Okay, so <laughs> l let's take me as a good example. <laughs> am I trying to sell you something or am I an actual scientist? D check my funding. What does it tell you? Well, actually, I, I don't have a checking mechanism, really. You test what you say. How do you test what I say if you if don't you know what I'm saying? What if it's accurate? Yeah, but how do you check that? I mean, it means that, that the source is not necessarily credible, and? And the next source is necessarily credible, thus? The source could be in also not credible, but also not a marketing scheme. We should check it regardless. Yeah, yeah, but what do you check it with? It's, it's, the, it's a problem. It's a recursive problem. If you... Same question. How do you measure a measurement microphone? Comparison. Huh? Comparison. 
and one is better than the other based on what? <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I want empirical data. I have a measurement microphone. How do I measure it? <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to measure? Well, I, I mean, I want to measure room responses and all the rest of it, but it just doesn't work. You have to understand, language is self-referential. I mean, there are a few embodied mind, you know, kind of things in there in terms of pain up and down, a few basic metaphors that are quite physical, but actually it's a self-referential system. If I ask you, what does the word nose mean? You are going to use a bunch of words to describe that. And each one of those words can be questioned again. And typically, most you can do is describe them, except the nose is a good example, because I can just say, mm, that's nose. OK? So th th we, we have some issues here. You cannot take things for granted. And there is no absolute source, right? So if you say, I'm going to check the credibility of this source by looking at another source, I'm going to check the credibility of the second source. It's the same problem back again. Any practical ideas? Because this is the kind of theoretical covering that they serve us. What about like, if they own up to their mistakes, I would say? Like, that's like, maybe not an absolute metric, but it is like a good that's, that's going in a, in a good direction, I think. Because you see, if one thing you can recognize, marketing, everything is good. You know, everything serves you well. It's the best solution. It's the cheapest solution. It has a lot of superlatives, mm -hmm. a lot of bests. Uh, typically, the way you recognize uh, a contemporary scientific field, at least, is that the experts disagree. So if you find something where there is too much agreement, you can be very suspicious. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's great if it's a drum and bass party and everyone is in agreement. <laughs> but we're talking no, science not, here. Yeah. Huh? Disagree. Disagree, at but you don't, you don't stand there and watch it happen anyway. Ah, you, you go there in order to disagree, great. I hope you keep this attitude in the class as well, at the university. See, it's the same thing. If you believe what I have to say, right, then this is a church and I'm a priest, which I may, you know, like to be. But you have to remain skeptical, right? You have to keep verifying, you have to keep running your own logic. You know, you, you have to trust your own logic. I mean, in a way, you see, it's, it's a kind of a double catch again, because you may say that you trust the authority, but it's always you who has a higher authority which selects what to trust. So you cannot externalize this thing to start with. You have to take charge of your thinking mind and be totally confident that this is my thinking capacity and by acquiring other people's thoughts, it's not going to improve my thinking capacity, right? It's going to improve your capacity to reiterate stuff and follow recipes and instructions. Who likes instructions? A little bit. Recipes, yeah? It's, it's very interesting. I think I'm, I'm back in Bristol. I've been away. I teach here only in the first semester, as you might know. So I've been away for a long while. And I feel the madness. There's something really lovely and mad about this place. There, there is a sense of uh, resistance and, and kind of boiling things and yeah. dirt as well. It's going around, so I, I feel dirty. <laughs> Everything is quite dirty. OK, so yeah, so how do we distinguish uh, marketing research? You know, if everything is good, if everything is great, it's perfect, it's good, it's unlikely to be very good science, right? If it answers more questions than it poses, again, you know, uh, typically scientists keep uncovering questions more so than answering the existing ones. Okay? And then obviously, you know, the background of it. I mean, you are probably aware, you might not be, that everything you see on your screens, big or small, is there because someone has paid for it to be there. And when someone pays for you to see something, they have a reason for you to keep looking at it, right? So be, be aware of, you know, your position as an entity in the world which is built around making you believe things, right? And it can be great, you know, if, you, if you're trying to, you know, get romantic with someone and you make them believe you're a good guy. I mean, that's fine, obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the game and all the rest. <laughs> But, you know, it's, 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 it's something that you can be really alert to, 
Okay. Now, the, the other few things which are kind of obvious, you know, what is the source? Is it a guy in a bedroom with an expensive, you know, uh, kit uh, making a video about some or other fact in acoustics? Is it, a, is it a university lecture? Typically, we do have some, you know, credibility to start with. Is it a peer-reviewed journal? Is it a published book in acoustics? Is it this kind of things? Okay, so when you do this, I'm not sure how much research you will do it, but I expect some of you will need this for your projects anyway. You know, you really want to avoid uh, podcasts, like privately made scientific myth-busting. Although some of that myth-busting can be great. In fact, what you, what you can discover, typically in music tech, is that people either come to it for the love of physics and, you know, concrete science, and then somehow with the with that perspective enter the field or what they have is love for music and then they get more technical right and you can very quickly recognize what people are like what do you think about me then more music or more tech both, I would say. both. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually a bit of both yeah i started early with with both quite early on yeah. but i would say that that actually it's probably a bit more tech probably a bit more tech, because I'm a, I'm a tool maker. So I have made a plenty of tools, and I've earned full satisfaction just by completing the tool, and after that I never even bothered using it, or hardly. Okay, that's how you recognize a techie what guy. Kind of tool? Huh? What kind of tool? All sorts of code, VSTs, you know, uh, then all sorts of hardware, uh, algorithms, solutions, uh, generative stuff, you name it. Uh, instruments I, I make instruments and then they're done and I'm like wow <laughs> and then I start making the next one so actually I mean not always but that's the general tendency uh, so I, I really work well with an artist who can take it home and will not try to make it better but will try to make music with it so that's how you recognize a more artisty type is that they look for tools and when they grab a hold of a tool they squeeze everything out of it. They're really good in, you know, completely discovering the ability of the tool, right? And that's, you know, we are kind of in the middle anyway with music tech. So it's a good way of, you know, finding a creative collaborator like that, that you can work with, like right? someone makes tools or even the group, like I mentioned, the bicycle teams. Okay, so yeah, and I will try, I mean, the other thing that you really recognize is the terminology used. Okay, uh, I mean, I'm really trying hard to uh, use accurate expressions, uh, appropriate terms, but when I watch these videos, I have to admit there's a few mistakes which are like, oh my God, did I just say that? It was just a twist of tongue, I couldn't have said that. It just happens. You can't keep making very accurate sense and that was a horrible sentence already. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's how you recognize the terminology. So that's why actually it's really useful to get, grab hold of the, of the basic terms and really understand their meaning. Okay, uh, typically, you know, if I say, what frequencies does this piano have? That's a really bad question. It doesn't say anything, right? Frequencies. Does it have frequencies where? What is a frequency? Let me hear it. What's a frequency? It's a rate at which something is uh, coming up and down. Repeating. Rate of repetition. Great. What rates of repetitions does the piano have then? <laughs> it doesn't, you see? So, so you have to c kind of be really cautious and, you know, feel free to correct people and tell them, no, 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 you can't say this. Right? Or, or what, what is the frequency of my voice? But rate of repetition, well, for you it's once per week probably. <laughs> I can be clever about that. But typically in this case, uh, a good term to use would be what? Frequency. Instead, if I, if I want to ask something about the spectral characteristic of my voice, a good question would be? Uh, no, because it can change. Uh, what range? What range does? Yeah, range of what? Frequency. 
It's frequency range. What is a good word for frequency range? Spectrum. Spectral what? Uh, B. Bandwidth. You see, so as soon as you read, see, see one of these YouTube guys, I'm a YouTube guy, by the way, but it's normally this shit and some drums. Uh, <laughs> if I say spectral bandwidth, you're supposed to have a sensation of, oh, you know, it's like, okay, so there's something real about, you know, something real has been said. Okay, so these terms, so, uh, and please, I invite you, I will be using words like spectral bandwidth quite frequently. Uh, frequently, ha ha. Uh, but when I do these things and when I say something which is weird or you don't quite get it, you have to ask me. You know, it's, it's actually a sign of a good student. Most people think that the good students are the clever ones who know everything already. No, the good students are the ones who learn the most in the process. Right? So you can come here. It's the same thing with, with uh, uh, final year projects that uh, evolve around music. We might have a few in the house. You know, it's, it's not about how cool was your production before, or how cool is your final production. It's about how much did you progress and how much did you use the resources available to progress. Because if I lock you up in a prison, you know, with sufficient food, drink, and whatever you need, you know, and say, you got three months to make this album, you can't get out, you can't do nothing, okay, you will progress, you will do things, right? But I hope I didn't describe your <laughs> life circumstance, by the way. Or at least not anymore, right? Finally. Uh, but the thing is that, you know, the point is to use the resources available here, right? So we had a chat earlier about snares. Okay, there is a guy who has a collection of snares worth a few thousand K at least. Each one of them is worth a few thousand K. Okay, so look him up, you know, get to the source of things. That's the thing you have the opportunity to do. You'll probably be locked up one way or the other again. I hope I don't make you <laughs> cringe at this stage. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so this kind of, you know, terminology, being accurate, being scientific, this is what it's all about as far as I'm concerned. And it's what gets you the job. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's, it's the kind of background I have. But when I go, I had two interviews in my life, and I got both, pretty much. Uh, and it's just because I use the right terms. If, if, if I talk to a dean or a kind of a senior academic, they have the ah oh, feeling because I tend to formulate things like that. Okay, so you can really recognize the background of a person, the way they think, by what terms they use, how they are talking about these things. You know, are they trying to convince you? Okay, so I will try to be convincing, but I've set you up for distrust. And please hold on to it, you know. I might be saying, I mean, I'm already saying dubious things, and it's going to get worse. Okay, so th that's, one, that's one main thing, I would think. And then we will look at some equations, unless everyone rises, raises their hand now and say no equations. Okay, you're not everyone. So we're going to do some equations. I mean, it's just an open thing because there's still th things taking shape. I have been asked to make this module more practical this year. I'll come to that if we have the time. 34, we have the time. Okay, fluency terminology, I've talked about this practical ability. So the point is that every practical we will be doing measurements. I've just found out we have six kits available. Measurement, microphone, sound card, and an active speaker. Okay, so for each practical session we will have six kits, and I will ask you to get into groups and probably multiple rooms, definitely multiple rooms. I just have no clue which ones. It's still kind of up in the air. If anyone has an Apple laptop with fuzz measure running and wants to be a core of a group throughout, I will be very thankful because then that group can roam around places because otherwise groups will be stuck in the given classroom that has fuzz measure available. Okay? I'm also about to write to Rode, who owns fuzz measure now, and ask them, could you please give us some kind of student license discount running out, anything you can think of. Isn't it the free one? There is a free one. I'm still yet to look at how good it is, uh, or because we're going to look into some detail of the applications. I heard that, like, you know, for measure mics, I don't know this time, but there was like a really good free software. There is some room EQ wizard, but th the thing with fuzz measure is that it gives you a whole lot of acoustic units mm -hmm. straight out of the box things like clarity, you know, different ratios. It can do a very neat subtraction of different analysis graphs. 
which will be very informative. Right. It's kind of straight out of the box. We could use his tools. We could use a lot of things that you can get to program and everything. But we're going to actually try to focus on interpreting it. Because all too often, what we see, in, typically in final year projects, is some or other spectral display and says, there it is. You see the difference. Ha, ha, ha. You can't even laugh at that. It's yeah. probably going to cry sooner or later. Uh, you know, so, so actually interpreting a graph, knowing what it's worth, is a huge chunk. It's a much bigger chunk than obtaining the graph these days. Because it's just going to be a click. Goes, and that's it. Okay, so it's going to be more about... And these graphs look nice. We can print them well. So fuzz measure is the weapon of choice. Um, so we're going to be doing that. We'll see exactly how you will find out next Friday. Uh, obviously, we'll have the lecture, and then I will make it clear how it works. In fact, we have this slot, which is one, two, three, I believe, for the practical. But actually, we finished the class at 10.30. Yeah. And it's all combined the whole day. We're kind of, uh, you're, you're between me and Luke with APP. And with him, you have groups. With me, you don't quite have groups. But you will have your own produced internal groups. And I'm around all day anyway to help you if you get stuck. So if you feel like, OK, we have a group. We have a gap between 11 and 1. We're going to do the practical already. Yeah. I'm happy to do that as well. In fact, in that case, and you've said it, it's good. And I'm happy to do that already. What I'll do then is I'll prepare a video instruction. Or maybe what I'll do is I'll stretch the lecture another 20 minutes, do the measurement instruction, and put it online on video already. So you can look at it later at any time, do the practical, kind of feel free. You know, I, I hate to you know, tell people what to do and when to do it, in all honesty, probably because I hate being told what and when to do. Um, so I'm really happy to leave it open to you. The other thing is, so we will have, I think, nine or 10 measurements like this. It's going to be quite exciting, I hope. And then assessment will contain measurements as well, which you will have to perform on your own. OK, so I'll talk a bit about that in a second, indeed, right now. So the assessment strategy for this module, as of this year, by the way, it used to be a, an exam. So you're safe now, although exams are great. Especially, I, I actually developed quite a neat open book exam. And what that does, it doubles up as a learning session. In fact, it, it, it becomes the most valuable learning session because you spend 10 hours researching things, you know, under pressure and having to do it. Uh, but it didn't quite work out. In fact, it didn't work out very well. Can I, can I make another kind of typical statement which is under-exaggerating in order to make the point? I, I, I'm not sure if I love this aspect of English language, at least the way it's used in Britain. What, what's another way I can say something like, it wasn't too bad, right? If I say it, it was wasn't too bad, it was interesting. It, it turned out to be quite interesting, right? <laughs> and then everyone in the sense it was horrible. Great. Um, I, I like to spell things out. In fact, that's part of you know, having an academic mindset. You have to spell things out really accurately. But in any case, this year, we have a portfolio assessment type. Uh, you will see the official document soon enough, I hope. Uh, it's in the making. Uh, in any case, it consists of two things. One will be lecture notes and summative answers. OK, so the way I'm going to verify that you follow some of the lectures is that throughout the lectures, there will be questions that I will ask you to submit answers to at the end of the module. So in essence, what I'll be asking you to have is for every lecture, theoretical lecture, you should have one A4 sheet of your notes and the answers to the questions. OK, so kind of reminder what is, I'm happy if it's an artistic thing with colors and schemes and handwritten. I'm happy if it's really structural. The way your mind works. You know, I mean, obviously, I'm going to look at these things in some de detail, right? <laughs> But what I'm interested in is that you end up with some set of notes, and three years later, when someone asks you, what the hell does the balcony do to the acoustic of a concert hall, you have somewhere to go to. And I'll show you my lecture notes, which is one sheet for all 10, which is probably going to, I hope, uh, you know, 
uh, make you feel inferior <laughs> because it's really good source of references like that. So every lecture, you can do it, uh, you don't have to do it week by week, I suggest you do, but all the lectures will be uh, taped, you can always watch them again and do the process of taking notes. In fact, it might actually work better for you if you're just paying attention in the lecture, don't worry about anything around you, and then watch the thing again, and then, you know, things sink in better, then you make the notes, look up the sources. It's really up to you. Okay, but in any case, that's going to be 10 pages, as far as I see it now, and then the other half of the portfolio is the practical part, which will be your measurements and an analysis thereof. Okay, so I've initially envisaged that you measure your bathroom, measure the transmission from the bathroom to your bedroom, measure your bedroom, measure your speakers. There will be a few things. Measure the flanking from the upstairs neighbor. You know, something that may be of practical value personally, but it may be that you cannot run fuzz measure at home. You will be able to rent the kit. So as soon as you have fuzz measure, by the way, you can use things that are like room EQ wizards and other solutions. I'm happy with that. But in any case, you can always fall back to using it in the studios. Most of our studios have fuzz measure installed. You can always grab a microphone. You can measure that studio. It'll, it'll do. Okay, but I'll be very happy if you manage to contextualize these tasks to make it interesting for yourself. And typically things like, you know, do I treat my room? Where do I put the speakers? Things like this, I guess everyone is interested in learning. So you can typically focus on your room or studio or shed if you're lucky. Cool, so that's the portfolio. And then the reading list, I'll briefly show you that. It's huge and it's great. Uh, this is what you get on, oh, this is not what you get under the link. Uh, escape that. Go to here. Oh, hello. Uh, why is it showing my desktop? Oh, shall I do it like that? Okay, quick fix. Okay, so the link that's there that you've just seen brings you here. In fact, this is the second step because you can see the previous years as well, but it's the same thing. Acoustics, quite a few books, really big, thick books. Uh, some of them have too many equations. Most of them you can view online. What I typically do is I take these books and I print out the table of contents. So I have like a, you know, 50 page thing with all the tables of contents of all the books. And that's what I study. Because the matter of fact is that lexical knowledge, the knowledge of facts has become secondary, finally. They used to hammer it like mad. Do you not remember what I've just said? Smack. You know, that, that's what education used to be. Uh, and actually, and the exams as well. I mean, the only reason, as far as I can tell, why you put someone under pressure when they perform is because you cannot give them a challenging enough task. You know. You know, do you remember this under gunpoint? <laughs> Obviously, it's been made more difficult, but that's, the not, no, that's not the point. The point is for you to develop an understanding of the field and actually the perspective. So you know what there is to know, and when you need it, you look it up. I mean, it's great if you have a Rainman mind and you can remember, you know, millions of things and recall them. But this guy didn't look quite clever, did he? <laughs> you know, so being clever is actually the, the associative capacity more than the capacity to recall, right? Uh, so I would definitely suggest, you know, you will see some of these books are 500 pages or more. If you that kind of person, please grab them, sleep with them, you know, any other intimate relationship <laughs> is welcome. <laughs> Screw them, I can <laughs> spell it out. Screw these books as much as you want. But have a look at them. Have a look at the table of contents. Remember, oh, okay, so that's the kind of thing they're discussing. This is the perspective. Is it a techie guy? Is it a musical guy? You know, where does it come from? You will always find, ah, this chapter sounds interesting. Read the chapter here and there. You know, it's very useful stuff. Uh, so you got all these. Actually, I don't see it on my screen. So I have acoustics. These are typically more technical books, okay? I have studios books. So this is typically acoustics of studios some building stuff. Newell's book, I think that's the kind of thing you want to have an intimate relationship with, you know. You really want to read this thing. He has been designing studios for decades and then he went into talking about this 
and just all the ins and outs. In fact, most of the lectures that go into studio stuff are based on his thing, and it's about 3% of what he has to share. This Philip guy? Yes, Philip Newell. No, yeah, Philip Richard Newell, this guy. Okay, so definitely, definitely check this out. Uh, Cutrop is more technical if you're into this. And uh, absorbers and diffusers is quite interesting, just read, because those are the two things we typically can do. We are unlikely able to move walls and, you know, kind of a godly act interventions and like that. Uh, so we typically treat rooms with stuff we put inside them. And one of the things that's really interesting, I can even suggest it for people who are still thinking about uh, finally a project, uh, search uh, eBay for a uh, job lot, okay? And find a truckload of something that could work as a diffuser or an absorber and do a project on that. We don't quite have this recycled material absorbers and diffusers. We still pay hundreds of quids for like a piece of something. But actually we have a whole lot of trash around this planet already and we can use it. How do you distinguish between stuff that can be used for absorption and diffusion? Any ideas? Yeah, but how do you recognize it? Well, so like surface uh, and density. Density. How porous it is. density is a good one. What did you say? Solid. How porous it is. Porous. Porous is a key term. Okay. It's porous. Porous means it has pores, like small holes, like foam. Mm. Actually, skin has pores as well. Right. right. So it's a porous material. It's typically a good absorber. Okay. Diffuser. What's the key word there? Random. Random. That's the exact word. Amazing. Yeah. So if it is a lot of random stuff, wh what does it take for things to be random? Well, if you have a lot of small things. So if you have a truckload of, you know, cut timber from, you know, from a building site, then you can just arrange this randomly. And if you're clever about it, you get a good diffuser. Okay, so those are the things. So if you want to get into this, that's a great source for that. Although they don't really go into recycling materials. Uh, but uh, bloody hell, where am I? Okay, and then concert halls. Concert halls is the kind of topic that is traditional acoustics in the music context, which is kind of slightly away from physics. Huge amount of stuff, very interesting things, but I don't know what's the relevance anymore. Uh, how many of you have been in a concert hall in the past year? One, two, three, four. Oh, that's quite good actually. Uh, but, you know, it's, there's millions of uh, design considerations, a huge history of things. But actually, we get quite, quite a good set of measuring techniques based on the findings from concert hall acoustics, like apparent source width, clarity, things like this. Okay, some concert hall books and some architecture books. Okay, so it's called architectural acoustics. If everything goes right, the last two lectures will be delivered by a guy who works as a consultant for architectural acoustics company. Okay, so he will give you the insider's thing. The matter of fact is that they're recruiting uh, constantly and half of their stuff comes from our course. We're kind of bread and butter like that. They really need people who have some basic understanding of things. Uh, and you see, they're not recruiting physics graduates who had acoustics course, but they're recruiting music techs because they have a broader view of what the hell is going on in this domain. Okay, so if you get friendly, I, I hope uh, the CEO will come around. He's a very funny guy, a lot of interesting anecdotes. Uh, uh, appears superficial, but it's actually really, you know, really at it. But in any case, Max, is likely to come again and do the last two lectures. Uh, as far as the ar architectural acoustics goes, you know, there's a lot of design, there's a lot of regulation and, and stuff which I don't find necessarily interesting. But building a shed for a studio, I do find interesting. In fact, I'm preparing to do exactly that. Uh, although I do have already a shed with a studio in there. Timber sheds are the best. Everyone knows why? No. Isolation? Uh, no, because a concrete wall will isolate better, but... You see, what's the difference between acoustic treatment and insulation? Uh, treatment changes the acoustic character, but the insulation, you can just create something cracked, right? 
No, no, it's... Uh, it separate the room from the environment. Yeah, it has to do with that. So, in essence, if you're doing acoustic treatment, you're making yourself happy. If you're doing insulation, you're making the neighbors happy. Okay? And that's the point. The best thing for a studio is a wooden shed in the forest, because there's no neighbors to complain. Right? So you don't have to take care of them. So you don't need to deal with insulation. The thing is, with insulation, it's kind of a weakest link principle. If there is one hole somewhere, a huge amount of acoustic energy will escape. What a beautiful term. Acoustic energy will escape. The sound goes out. Right? So that's, that's, that's the kind of thing I'm really trying to, to put through the, the, the way of expressing these things accurately. So that's why. And, but why is, is wood better than concrete for me inside the shed? Reflections. The base will radiate through the timber walls. It won't be reflected back. All, so the point is that I, I want to reduce reflections, right? And with the base, it's, it's typ typically the only way to, to do it. You just have to make sure it escapes. So if you're at all into this, this is a nice one because it kind of goes step by step. You know, how do you construct a house? Uh, but actually, there's quite a lot of things in terms of architectural design and, you know, where the acoustic comes in and all the regulations. Okay, so that's, that's the real source of knowledge. I'm the source of fun, I hope more so, uh, than these books. And, you know, the, the, the only way to learn something is by being interested. You know, if you're interested, you're going to learn it one way or the other. If you're not, you're going to forget it anyway. Right? So my task is really, more than anything, is to get you motivated and interested. If I manage to do this, that's, that's job done. You see, so actually part of this has to do with creating a burning question. If I give you a sequence of 10 answers to interesting questions, and I say, if you remember this, then you will be a knowledgeable person in the domain. I'm not serving you very well. What I have to do is I have to say, how about this? Wait a minute, so what's up with this? So I actually have to spend five minutes, you know, pumping it up, making the question really like, what the hell? So what is it? You know, and if I get you to that point of really wanting to know the answer, and then I give you the answer, it's again like establishing a romantic relationship, then it will stick, right? Otherwise, it will be just one ear in, one ear out. Oh, okay, done that, been there, I understand it. Next week, what? <laughs> you know, it really goes out quickly. So it, it is really crucial that you help me do this. You know, get into wanting to know the answer, getting, get into puzzling, right? That, that's one of the things that my generation had much more than you guys, it seems, and it really serves well. You know, spend a childhood with puzzles rather than with entertainment, like things that, you know, you do and they're great for you. You know, puzzles, things that you may not get to the bottom of, but they're confusing, they're complex. You know, puzzles are great. So try to get your mindset into into this. By the way, there is good neurological evidence by now that the best way to learn is, is to fail frequently. In fact, if you are in the emotional uh, space of disappointment and then some factual thing arrives, you're going to remember it like nothing else. Okay? And it, it's kind of tricky. I also try to avoid disappointment in my creative and scientific uh, endeavors. But embracing disappointment is a really good tool. If you can do this, you've, you've got it all. all. right? So kind of be able to fail. Although I have to say it very frequently to myself as well, you know, making a tune, spend two days. On a third day, you should be able to trash it all, bin it. You should be able to say, well, listen, I know I've done it. I know I spent hours. I know I liked it last night. Who knows why? But it's horrible. Bin it. You know, binning things. Get, get this dynamic of not being too protective about your work, not being too protective about having to be a success all the time. I mean, it's, I know it's difficult. It's difficult for me as well. You know, we were kind of conditioned to try to perform well. I think Bukowski, anyone reads Bukowski at this age? Yeah. Bukowski is a good guy. Yeah, which, which book, <laughs> Every book. Wait, Ham and Rice, the best, I think. It's his childhood memories. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But he, he has a quote, don't drink as much as he does, please. Uh, although he has lived a long and happy life, yeah. and you might be drinking more already, who knows. But uh, he has this quote, it says, uh, 
you know, failure is freedom. You know, un unless you can really embrace like, yes, I'm gonna just fall flat on my nose like this, you know. And if you can do it sober, it's even better probably. You know, so because the fear of failure is holding us back the most. At least personally, I know the things that I don't do and I wanna do, the reason why this is fear failure. Again and again, and I keep doing it. So deal with it if you can. Okay, learning outcomes, we have four minutes left. Uh, please read them. Uh, we're not gonna get to my uh, basic equation understanding and wavelength and frequency and decibels. Oh, you're not seeing it. Thank you for notifying me again. Uh, let's see, I have to, if I do this, that helps. Okay, so what I had then is uh, learning outcomes. I'm gonna finish with the outline, so I'm keeping that. It just didn't fit on the slide. I have to zoom in and out because it's huge. Uh, basic equation understanding. If this is something that is kind of puzzling, please look at it. You know, speed, distance, time, time, distance, speed. It, it's supposed to be a, a kind of a existing knowledge thing. And then wavelength and frequency, you have supposed to have met it as well. It's that kind of thing. Uh, a basic fraction really rotate it around things like this I mean there is no exams where you have to perform calculation anymore so if you really disturbed by it you don't have to make yourself uncomfortable uh, but if you, if you think there is something for you in this then please look at it before we get to more complex things although we won't really wavelength frequency that kind of thing just to understand it. And then decibels. This is something that I expect everyone has heard of and I expect no one really gets it. So we're going to spend some time with this. My favorite example is something I will tell you next time because we're running out of time. Musical intervals, same thing. You know, hertz, C, D, D sharp. Okay, so I'm going to start the next lecture with these two things. Please prepare because if you can explain it to everyone, you will increase your ranking tremendously. And we all know that in mammalian societies, rank, it's all about ranking, okay? So please work on your ranking through uh, preparing for this module. Uh, and then I will finish with the overview, uh, which is my attempt at uh, producing a holy book or a holy page, uh, which I don't quite see because of its size. Uh, so what I have here on the left are the chapters. Hello? Where is my mouse? Why does this does? Oh, bloody hell. This is funny. I'm clicking through. Oh, because I'm here on, uh, sorry, give me a sec. Okay, back to this. Can I s scroll it at this stage? Please. Ah, here we go. Okay, so on the left we have the chapters. This will be the titles of the lectures. Okay, we're going to study waves, objects, rooms. To start with, there is some psychoacoustics in here. I might, I probably will keep it in there. Who cares? It's a great lecture. Uh, acoustical quantities. This is the kind of thing that relates to math, mostly. And then we get into more practical stuff, okay? Control rooms, recording studios, venues. And then the last two lectures should be externally delivered architecture and environment and consultancy. Okay, so now the second column spells out some of the topics in there, okay? The third column spells out the practical topics in there. And typically I pick the terms that should be puzzling, okay? So please fall in love with being puzzled. You know, it's, I know it's not, you know, the first thing that comes to mind when something is puzzling that it's good, but actually the puzzling things are the best things around, okay? So, so I typically pick terms which are not quite clear and I pick terms which describe things which are not, you know, self-evident. Right, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of assuming knowledge on your part already. Uh, so practical topics for each one of these. Graph table understanding drawing. Okay, so this used to be the part of the exam. Again, it's not going to be verified like this, but it's an interesting thing to observe. It's an exam or portfolio? It's a portfolio. It used to be an exam. Uh, so we're not going to do a task. Actually, I might squeeze it in, in one or two weeks just to get some sense of uh, graph table understanding. I mean, it's, it's a luxurious thing that, you know, I can adopt the content to your liking. 
okay? So maybe I, it seems I'm not paying huge attention to your emotional state, but I actually am, right? So when I notice, okay, this is not working, this is working really well, I have the opportunity to mix and match, exclude things, include things. So please help me with this, right? So, oh, and like wearing your jacket already, things like this help, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm aware of the time. So calculation tasks for those of you who are interested and then one more column, sorry, further research topics. Okay, so on top of the stuff that I deliver, there are some really interesting topics that you can get into. Here is the list of those, okay? And then the most interesting thing, the book chapters. So for each of these lectures, you can actually say, oh, bloody hell, that's quite a lot of chapters. There's quite a lot of repetition there. You might find an author, a book that really reads well, that's something that, you know, sticks well, you can do that. But in any case, it's a kind of a reference thing, right? So if you say, okay, I have to know something about control rooms. Control rooms chapter, what are the book chapters? Oh, this is technical, this is good, this is that. So it's a kind of a point of <laughs> reference. Uh, I'll actually attempt to make A3 pages. Anyone likes to hang bullshit in their bathrooms? <laughs> toilets? Yeah? So I will ask you to hang an A3 sheet of this in your toilet and take a selfie with it and I'll buy you a beer if you do that. Yeah. Okay, thanks for coming. Uh, if you're interested at the island, I probably won't make it by five, but I'm going to play some stupid noise at seven. And th there is free wine. Island and Spike Island is the island gallery. That's the social I'm proposing. Uh, I think there is free wine. I'm not sure. But I think you can bring your own and we can go to a pub after or maybe grab a pizza. I don't know, whatever you like. Thanks for coming and I'll see you next Friday.